Before lunch break, we started to look at NumPy, so we can define arrays. And now we started to look at how we can define multi-dimensional arrays. So matrices and even higher dimension than that. Uh, now let's see how we can work with those arrays and access and slice and select items. And it's pretty similar to how it works with one dimensional objects. Only that to specify each element, we'll need to now provide two indices. So as an example, we create a matrix with five rows and three columns. You can see it here. And now if we want to select a specific item, within the square brackets, we now give two numbers, two indices, separated by a comma. So we can provide, for example, four and two. And that will um, reference the element which is in row index four and column index two. So uh, the last row and the last column. That would be item 14 in this case. Okay, so by spe specifying two indices, we get a specific item. Now we can select even uh, specific rows or specific columns if you want. For example, we can access row index four and not specify any constraints on the column. So essentially, we'll get the entire row and you can see it here. So doing that on a two dimensional array will give us a one dimensional array because we'll get the entire uh, fifth row in this case, which you see the, the values here. And similarly, we can specify that we want column index two and no constraints on the row. So we'll get in the entire column and you see the result here. Again, it will be a one dimensional array. And now that it's one dimensional, it doesn't even remember if it used to be a column or a row or whatever. We just slice it and we get it as it is. And we can put constraints on uh, different axes or dimensions if we want. For example, we can query all the rows between one to three, not including three, so just the second and the third rows. And we'll take all the columns, but in reverse order, like we know we can do using this uh, slicing notation. And indeed what we'll get, we'll get the second and third rows with the columns in reversed order. So it will be five, four, three, eight, seven, six, if we query this way. Is this clear? Questions? Okay, and we can use this multi-dimensional querying uh, not only to select, but also to assign values. So for example, let's say we have a matrix of zeros with eight rows and three columns. And we want to take uh, the sixth row and replace it with other three, three values. So we want to replace it with uh, five, six, seven. So we can do this kind of assignment. We select the row or whatever part of the matrix we want to change. And then on the right hand side of this assignment, we put the value, which can be an array or a list or anything that has an appropriate shape. In this case, we expect something of size three, which is one dimensional. So uh, this range does a job. And you can see that indeed it replaces the sixth row with this range. And that's indeed what we get. And this also works for higher dimensions. So we can, for example, take the three row, first three rows uh, with no restriction on the columns and replace it with another three by three matrix. For example, all the numbers between zero <laughs> to eight after we reshape it to a three by three matrix. And you can see that Indeed, the original matrix was changed in that way. So we took the first block of three by three and replaced it with another matrix. Okay, so as long as the shape of the left-hand side matches to the shape of the right-hand side, you can do any assignment that you want and it works. Questions?
OK, now let's talk about vectorized arith arithmetics. So let's say we have two arrays of size 3. We have A and B. We can do what is called a vectorized operation by using some kind of an operator on these two uh, vectors or on these two one-dimensional arrays. For example, if we use the plus operator, we will get the element-wise addition of these two vectors. So you can see that if we add this vector to this vector, we'll get a vector whose first value is the addition of the first values within each of the two vectors. And the second is the addition of the seconds. And each one is the addition of the corresponding values in the original vectors. And likewise, if we use the multiplication operator, we will get the element-wise multiplication of the two vectors. And that also applies to higher dimensions. So if, for example, we have a matrix A and a matrix B, and then we calculate the multiplication of these two matrices, you see that what we get is simply the element-wise multiplication of the corresponding elements. For example, if we take the last element of the second row, here it's 5, here it's 3, so the multiplication will be 15. And for those of you who know MATLAB, it's important to know that it's different than how it works in MATLAB, for example. In MATLAB, if you do multiplication, then by default, what it means is the linear algebra type of matrix multiplication, which is different than the element-wise. Uh, so, so in NumPy, it's much simpler, uh, especially for our purposes, which we uh, mostly won't use any linear algebra stuff. Uh, but if you do want to make some linear algebra style multiplication, you can do it using the dot opera opera operator. So there is a function, you can give it two matrices, and it will multiply them in the linear algebra style. There is also the uh, thing which is called broadcasting, which allows you to do operations even when you do not have exactly the same shapes of the thing you try to operate on. For example, if you take a scalar, just a number, and multiply it by a vector, for example, a vector of five ones, what you will get is simply the element-wise multiplication of this uh, number with the values in this vector. So in this case, we'll get 3.14 five times because you multiply a vector of fives with that number. And if you use addition, then the number will be added to each of those elements independently. And you'll get 4.14. And this works not only for scalars, but also for higher dimensions. So for example, if you take a matrix A and a vector B, which you can see here, so you have this matrix and this vector. If you add the vector B to the matrix, what you will actually get is the row-wise addition. So, so this vector will be independently added to each of the rows uh, of the matrix. So for the first row, we'll get 0 plus 0. And then the one here plus the one here will get 2. And then the 2 here plus the 2 here will get 4. And then the same vector will also be applied to the second row. So we'll get 3 plus 0 again, which is a 3, 5 plus 1, which is 5, and 5 plus 2, which is 7, and uh, the same for the third row. OK, so just a row-wise addition. And the way it works is it works for any dimension. And the default rule is that the broadcasting happens to um, to the last dimensions. So if you take something of, of shape uh, 3 by 3 and you broadcast it to something of shape 3, then this uh, 3 will be uh, cor will correspond to the second 3 of, of the matrix. So it will be the columns in this case. And, just it, and then it will just happen uh, for each of the rows independently. Yeah, questions? No, it won't allow you. So you can only broadcast if the things you are broadcasting, the last shape at least for the last dimensions. So 
so you take the, the entity with a lower number of dimensions and you need uh, its shape to match to the last dimensions of the entity with a higher number of dimensions. And then it would work. Now, vectorized operations are sometimes a little bit less intuitive, at least for uh, beginners, which are more used to working with loops. But they really are very nice, and they can be much more elegant and save you a lot of programming. And not only that, even more importantly, they're much, much more efficient. So let's see. Uh, let's do some benchmarking. So we take two vectors here of shape 10,000, uh, say a vector A and a vector B, each with 10,000 elements. And we try to calculate the element-wise addition using two different approaches. Uh, the first approach is what we already know, using a Python loop, in this case using the for comprehension. So we can, for example, use the zip function to get the corresponding element from each of, the, of these two vectors. So the ith element of A and the ith element of B, and then we can add them together and we get a list with the result with the element-wise addition of these two, or we can simply uh, write a plus b, which will give us uh, the same result using the NumPy arrays. And I use the time it magic command to measure the performance of each of these two options. So you can see that the first option takes approximately 1.5 milliseconds, whereas the second one takes eight microseconds. So that's like a difference of a factor of like 200, okay? Uh, now, now maybe you should take a moment to appreciate uh, the meaning of that because it's really, it's really a huge difference, okay? That's like the difference between uh, a code that maybe runs for a few seconds to something that will take you a whole hour to, to finish or something that you can go on a lunch break and leave it to run and then you come back and it's ready or something that will take you a whole month to finish. So. <laughs> So that's like the difference between feasible and infeasible computation. And when we're talking about the bottleneck of your program, that's like super crucial. That's like the difference between something you can do and something you cannot do. So at, at this point, it might be, again, less intuitive for you to work this way. Maybe you're more used to thinking in terms of loops and, and, and working this way. But I really encourage you to try to make the shift starting uh, from now up to the end of the course, we'll see even more tools that allow us to work in a vectorized way. And I think that once you get used to it, it's really, really much better. It's much more efficient for programming time because it's much shorter code and you can break down your complex operation into quite elementary uh, vectorized operations. So it's also more readable and nice to write. And it's also much, much, much more faster. So really, I really encourage you to, to start, um, see how you can incorporate it into your uh, programming. Okay. Now, now we, we've seen that arrays are quite like lists in many ways, so they behave pretty similarly. So a lot of the syntax that we're used to from lists also applies to arrays, and that's not an accident. That uh, the developers of NumPy wanted it to be intuitive to Python users. Uh, but there are also some crucial differences, which are important to note. So for example, we've seen that the plus and the multiplication operators have a very different meaning in NumPy than they have with Python lists. So in Python, we know that if we have two lists and we use a plus operator, we will just concatenate the two lists. Whereas in NumPy, it means that we want to do a vectorized addition operation, element-wise. And same goes for multiplication. If we take a list and multiply it by a number, for Python lists, it means we just want to duplica duplicate the elements like three times. Whereas in NumPy, it means we want to calculate the element-wise multiplication with that number. Okay, so it works differently. And you should know these differences and al always be aware whether you work with a list or with an array. Now, if you want something like in Python, for example, if you want to concatenate arrays, you can use just the NumPy concatenate function, which uh, will get a list of arrays and will concatenate them one after the other. And if you want to duplicate something, you can use the tile function, which will get an array and a number and will 
uh, duplicate it the given number of times. NumPy also supports all kinds of mathematical methods which allow you to, again, work more efficiently and perform many element-wise functions. For example, we have the mean or the average functions. Uh, these are two different names to the same thing, so they're uh, pretty much the same. So you give it a bunch of data and it will calculate the average or the mean of the data and you have the STD function which stands for standard deviation which given an array of numbers will give you the standard deviation. And you can also calculate the median if you want. There are the sum and product functions which will sum all the numbers or multiply all of them if you want. And you can see the result here. You have the max or the minimum functions which will give you the highest or the lowest value within an array. And again, it's more efficient to use these functions than to use the Python functions which then will resort back to, to the Python implementation, which is less efficient. <coughs> also quite useful is the argmax and argmin functions. So they will uh, get an array, and instead of giving you the maximum value, they will give you the index of the maximum <coughs> value. So you get three, basically it means that the maximum value is the one with index three, it's 22. And the one with the lowest value, at least its first occurrence, is the one in index zero here. So let's see an example. So we can calculate the z values, which given a bunch of data, we just want for each element to calculate the difference from the mean and divide it by the standard deviation. And in NumPy, we can just do it just with one line. We take the data, we convert it to an up array, we subtract the mean, and we divide by standard deviation, and thanks to the vectorized element-wise operations, it will all happen in the same line of code. Uh, during the second lesson, I think I showed you many functions of the math module. So for all, pretty much all the functions in the math module of Python, you have a corresponding NumPy function, uh, which not only works on a single number, but can work on an array and do it again in a vectorized way. So for example, you have the exponent function, which will calculate the exponent of each value in an, an array, or you cal can calculate the logarithm, which by default is with base of E and you can use vectorized operations to, use, to calculate with any base by calculating the log and then divide by the log of the base you want. And if you want a base of two or a base of 10, you have specific log functions for that. You can use trigonometric functions. And again, you can uh, take everything and and chain operations together. So for example, you can take the, uh, the sinus of the data, of each element, and calculate its square, and add a cosinus of the data, and calculate its square, and you can, op you can chain all of these element-wise operations, and you get the output that you expect to get. And you can also calculate the absolute value. And like with the math module, you have reference to some important mathematical constants, if you want. OK, now many of, of the, these operations, uh, by default, they will work on the entire data together. So for example, if we have a matrix of 3 by 5, and we calculate its average, it will pretty much ignore the shape of the matrix. It will just treat it as one array with 15 numbers and we'll just give you the average of all of these numbers together. So it will be seven. Uh, but sometimes you want it to take into account the shape of the array. For example, you might want uh, to calculate the average of each column independently. And so many of the functions within NumPy, they accept an argument which is called an axis, which if you change it, will determine according to which axis you want the operation to be performed. So if, for example, you want it 
to be, to be performed by the first axis, which is the rows, you can set axis to equal to zero, and then the averaging will be across rows. So for each column, you will get the average of the three row values. So we will get the average of the first column, the second, the third, fourth, the fifth, which is what you get here. And if you set axis to be one, then it will work column-wise, and the averaging will be across columns, and for each row, you will get its average, and you will get a result of shape uh, three. Questions? <laughs> okay. NumPy also supports generating random numbers, like the random module in Python. Uh, but again, with the expected benefits of being A, more efficient, and B, working with arrays and higher dimensions. So for example, we can use the np-random-rand-int function, which is very similar to the rand-int function of the random module in Python. You will get two numbers, and it will generate a number between them. Uh, there is a, a slight difference, however, that in random rand it of Python, it's including the last integer, and in NumPy it doesn't include. So rand it of three to five in NumPy will only give you threes and fours. And now here's the kicker. You can use it to specify any shape of array that you want. So for example, if you want 10 random values, between three and five, you can provide afterwards 10 and you will get an array with 10 of these values. Or you can give it a tuple and specify any shape that you want. For example, you want a matrix with four rows and 12 columns, then no problem. It will generate these uh, random matrix for you. We can use the random rand function to generate a uniformly distributed random number between zero and one by default. And if you give it multiple values, then it will use them as a shape. So for example, four and three, will generate a random matrix with four rows and three columns with random numbers between zero and one. Now, if you want the uniform uh, distribution to be not between zero and one, but between any two arbitrary numbers, you can use a different function. You can use the uniform function, which gets the start range and the end of the range, and then the shape. And this will generate six numbers between this number to that number. Uh, yeah, question. Yeah, we'll soon see about Gaussian distribution, but this is a uniform distribution, okay? Yeah. Uh, now, I will note that the syntax of, of NumPy when it comes to specifying shape is a little bit inconsistent, and it's sometimes annoying. So some functions expect to get the shape as a tuple, whereas other functions get it as separate arguments. So for example, we've seen that, I don't know, the zeros function wants to get a shape as a tuple, but the rand function will get it as two separate or three or any number of different arguments. Uh, so so pay attention to that and make sure that you give it correctly or otherwise we'll get an error. And yeah, th this is a bit confusing and annoying and I don't know why they did it that way, but it, it's somewhat inconsistent and you just need to know uh, which way you need to specify for each function. Uh, so yeah, so I was asked whether we can also do a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution, and the answer is, of course, yes. We can use the rand n function, standing for random normal distribution, and this will generate a Gaussianly distributed random number with a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. If we want a different mean and standard deviation, we can use the simple uh, probability rules to, to shift the distribution. So we can take uh, a standard normal distribution and multiply it by three and then it's, and add six to the result. And 
the output will be a random number which is normally distributed with a mean of 6 and a standard deviation of 3. And like with other functions, if we give it arguments, then it will be treated as the shape of what we expect to get. So this will generate two rows and three columns. OK, let's talk about Boolean arrays. So like with numbers, we can define NumPy arrays with Boolean values. So we can take, for example, three Booleans and convert it into an array. And you can see that we get an array with three Boolean values. And when we ask for its type, we see that it's of type Boolean. Uh, now many of the operations, of the vectorized operations that we'll use can return an array of Booleans. For example, if we have an array of numbers and we use the equal equal operator to compare it to one, then it will just be the element-wise comparison and we'll get a corresponding Boolean vector where for each position it tells us whether the original value was one or not. And you can see that only the ones give true. And likewise, we can use, for example, the less than equal operator, which will perform a similar kind of, of, of Boolean operation. Yeah, excellent question. And the answer is yes, and we're going to see that in a moment. But before that, uh, let's see more examples. Uh, so yeah, well, we can also use all kinds of, op of, of, of operators to, to chain these together. So we can use the tilde symbol, which stands for not. So if we want uh, to, take, to compare x to 5 and then to reverse the results, we can use the tilde uh, operator. Of course, we could have just used the not equals operator, which would be the same. And we can use the ampersand to specify we want n. So we want to check whether x is smaller than 8 and y is smaller than 8. And you can use the vertical line for or, uh, and then we'll get a, re a replace where either x is smaller or equals than 8 or y is uh, larger or equals to 8. And, and yeah, j just note that it's not exactly like with pure Python. So instead of using the uh, not or and keywords, which you are probably more used to, here you use these uh, strange symbols. <coughs> OK, and, and now I was asked whether we can use these uh, Booleans to, to slice or to query within an array. And the answer is yes, and this is really one of the awesome features of NumPy. So suppose that I have an array with eight elements, and I have a corresponding Boolean array with eight Boolean values, uh, which is often can be referred to as a mask, because this is some kind of a masking, where I want to specify for each element whether I want it or not want it. And here I print it. And now I can use the square bracket syntax to use the mask to query from x. So by doing x over this mask, I will only get the elements for which I have a true in the mask. So you can see that I get the first and the second elements, and I get the last two. These are the only ones with a corresponding true value. And everywhere where it's false, I will not get it. So this will just give me a sub array with four values. Now this is extremely useful because I can use that to chain all kinds of operations in a very nice way and very efficient because I don't have to do anything with Python. Everything just happens within NumPy without any for loops. Um, yeah, no, let, let's jump right straight to this example. So. So for example, if I have an array with 20 numbers, 
I can first compare it to zero and get only the to 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 select only the positive values. So this expression will give me a Boolean array of the same size as x. It will give me a Boolean array of size 20, where for each element it's true only if the corresponding value in x is, is positive. And then I can use this mask to query from x only in places where it's true, namely only in positive places. And effectively what this will do, it will give me just the positive numbers. So it's a very efficient way to filter just the positive numbers out of x and, and filter out the negative numbers uh, using this very short and nice uh, operation, which is also very efficient. Quicker than if? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's much quicker because everything happens within NumPy. There is no Python operations here. So there is no loops, there is no Python conditions, everything just in the background uh, within NumPy. Yeah. If you want to keep the structure of the, of the matrix, let's say I want to get rid of all the, to leave it blank or to, if I want to get rid of the, mm. the results which are not the... You can, yeah, okay, so if you want to keep the original shape, you can use something which is called where. I'm going to show it in a few cells. Okay, let's see another example. So let's say we have this array with these numbers and we want to filter outliers. Okay, so the way we define outlier is anything which is more than two standard deviations away from the mean. Turns out that using NumPy we can again do it just with a simple one line uh, easy operation and here it is how it works. So Within the square brackets, we take the original data and we subtract the average element-wise. And then we use the NumPy absolute value to calculate its absolute value. So this will give us the absolute value of the distance of every point from the mean. And then we can compare it to two times the standard deviation of the same data. So this will Essentially, if we then put it within square brackets of the original vector, this will give us the, the filtration of only the data points which are less than two standard deviations away from the mean. And you can see that all the extreme values were indeed uh, filtered out like we wanted. Okay, and, and that relates to the question you asked about how we can keep the original shape. So we can use something which is called where. So if we use the where and specify a mask, so a Boolean array, we can say which values we want if it's true and which values we want if it's false. And you can see that it replaces all the truths with one and all the falses with minus pi. And we get an array of the same shape with the corresponding values. Now, th this can be changed together with other, other operations. So let's see, for example, how it works. Um, yeah, so let's say we have some metrics. Let's call it M. And let's say we want it, I don't know, shape uh, four rows and six columns. Let's do it less. Okay. And now let's say that we want to keep the shape of M and we just want to turn all the negative numbers into zeros. We can first write this operation uh, that will check whether something is negative. Okay, so now we get it true for each time uh, where we have a negative value. And we can use the where to convert, say, the truths to one and negative to zeros. And then we can use that to multiply it with the original function element-wise 
And OK, so now I think it's the opposite of what I wanted. Sorry. Yeah. Let's say it's greater or equal. OK, so you can now see that all the negative numbers turned into 0. Because every time I had a negative number, it turned into 0. And I multiplied it with the original value. And every time that it was uh, positive, I got a 1. And so the multiplication did nothing. So using these chain operations, I could filter away, say, and all the negative numbers and set them to 0. OK? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it has to do with the precision of Python. Um, so yeah, it's, it's re represented a little bit differently within NumPy. Um, but for any practical purpose, it's, it's zero. Sometimes you will see that uh, it's quite common to get this kind of error from NumPy, saying that the truth value of an array with more than one element is ambiguous, use any or all. And that happens when you have a Boolean array and you try to interpret that as a Boolean. So you cannot convert an array into the Boolean. By the way, the same error will occur if you try to use an if on an array. OK, we'll get the same error, basically, saying that you cannot really evaluate the truth value of an array. Uh, and it tells you to use either any or all, which are these functions. Any is just asking whether you have any true value within the array. So in this case, it will be true, because you have two true values. And all will give you true only if all the values are true. So it tells you, basically, to use either a any or a all. OK, now I think that's the last topic I wanted to cover. Uh, it's uh, the topic of NAND, standing for not a number, and infinity values within NumPy. So we've seen that within Python, we cannot divide by 0. We'll get an error. Uh, but when we work with NumPy, we can actually uh, we can actually divide by zero, and we get some output. We also get this warning message that we did something, uh, and something unexpected happened, and we might have a problem. But we not get an irrecoverable error, so it will allow us to do that. So if we take two arrays and divide them, divide say A by B. Even though b has some zeros, it will still allow us to do this operation. And just for these specific places, it will give us these uh, special values. So NumPy has the rule that if you take a positive and divide it by, a ne by 0, you will get infinity. And if you take a negative and divide by 0, you will get minus infinity. And if you try to divide 0 by 0, you will get what is called a NaN not a number. And on top of that, you will get all of these warnings. Now, sometimes you actually want to do that. And that's also the reason why NumPy allows you to do that. Uh, say you have a very large array. Just because for some values, you get something which is invalid, it's not good enough a reason to throw an error and stop you from doing it altogether. Maybe for most value, it works fine. And that's the way NumPy supports these vectorized operations when we deal with those uh, special cases. Now, if that's by design, if that's actually something that you want, you may want to silent away these annoying warnings. You can do it with a function which is called the error state. And you use it within the with syntax, which I mentioned in a previous lesson. So we talked about the with in the context of using files. And I said that it's more generic than that. And some packages allow you to support more kinds of context. So here you have another example of the NumPy package allowing you to specify a context of code <laughs> within which you don't want to get warnings about specific, um, about specific errors. 
So in this case, we want all the divide warnings to be ignored and all the invalid warnings to be ignored. So these are the warnings of dividing uh, by zero. And now everything that happens within this um, error state will be silenced. So you won't get these annoying warnings if it's something you anticipate and just want to be part of the code. But if you still have warnings outside of it, you can, you can still have the warnings. And there is also a way in NumPy to make global silencing. So you can just specify at the beginning of your program that you want to ignore all of these warnings. But I don't recommend you to do that. Uh, because then you might not know about warnings which you should be warned about. Okay, so the proper way to do it is just to isolate a specific part of your code where you anticipate to have these warnings and to silence it only there uh, such that you will not ignore unnecessary warnings that you do want to get warned about. Now you will get this funny uh, NaN and infinite values also if you do operations like a logarithm or a power with a fraction. For all of these, it's just mathematically undefined. So you don't have a logarithm of a negative value. And so you will get these, um, these special values. And then if you continue to work with them, so if you have an array with nans and infinities and the vector b with those values. When you do uh, vectorized operations, they will keep propagating in your code. So again, there are predefined rules. So for example, anything that you try to do with a nan will be a nan. So two plus a nan or two times nan will still be nan. And if you try to take something and add it to infinity, you will just get an infinity. And if you multiply a negative number by infinity, you will get minus infinity. So, so mathematically, it all makes sense. You can go over all of these cases and see that it's quite intuitive what, what NumPy does in those cases. Now, if you want to, to then check whether you had any nands or infinities, you have two functions which allow you to check that. You can use the isInf function, which checks whether some value is infinity, or the isNan, which checks whether something is, is not a number. So the isInf will give you true for infinity and minus infinity, and will give you false for anything else. And the isNan will give you true just for nans and false for anything else. One moment. So let's see an example. So let's say we want to take these values and calculate the element-wise logarithm of them. Uh, but then we want to filter away the NaN values um, bec because they, they, they don't mean anything to us. So you can see the original values. So wherever we had negatives, we now have NANs. And when you can use the isNan function, to check whether each value is an NAND. So you can see that only uh, the second and the third are NAND. And then we can use this mask to select from the original, from the original array only the places which are not NANDs. So we use the NOT over the is NAND of the array. And then we are left just with the three values which are valid numbers. Uh, question? <laughs> uh, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> uh, more questions? Okay. Even though they, they, they serve pretty much the same purpose, and they even have very similar names, so when we pronounce it NAN sounds like NAN, uh, these are not actually the same values, okay? So if you compare a NAN to a NAN using either the equals operator or the is statement, you will get a false. It's not the same value. And furthermore, if you use the is NAN function on a NAN, <laughs> you will get an error because the is NAN supports only numbers 
and the none type is not a number. You can actually see that the NAND, the INF, the infinity, and the minus infinity are just floating numbers. They are just special cases of floats. Okay, so they are numbers as opposed to the none. Any questions? Okay, so to summarize this discussion, let's see um, one last example of, of a more real life example of using NumPy to, ca to calculate nucleotide probabilities. So let's say we have this DNA sequence and we want to create a four by four matrix which counts how many pairs we have of each combination. So, so the first row will be A, C, G, and T. And so with the rows, we'll have the first row will be an A, C, G, and a T. And then you see each number here counts how many times we have a specific pair combination. So how many times we have an A followed by a G, the answer is 14 times. Uh, now, I'm um, sorry? Yeah, we, with overlaps, yeah. OK, now we're already behind schedule, so I don't want to dwell into this code example. I think th there is nothing, to, to nothing novel about it. So you, you can look at it later and see how this code works. Uh, but once we obtain these metrics, we can use the NumPy vectorized operations to normalize it and to get probabilities. So now what we want, we want each row to sum up to one such that these numbers will describe in some sense the probability of having each of the four nucleotides followed by each of the other four nucleotides. So for example, the first row will be the probabilities of having something after an A. So after an A, we see that there is a 0 0.07 chance of it being another A and 28% 20, of being a C and 50% of being a G and 40% of being a T nucleotide. So the way we normalize it, we can do it just with one NumPy operations, operation without any loops. So let's see how it works. We use the sum over the counts to calculate the sum of each of the rows. That's the reason why we give axis one, because we want for each row, we want its independent sum. And then we don't divide it straight with the metrics because then the broadcasting will not be the way we want it to be. So by default, if you remember, the broadcasting will divide, so, so this will give us a shape for a vector. And if we try to divide the metrics by this vector, this will try to, this will operate on each row independently. Um, but that's not what we want. We want it to be on each row independently because the first va value correspond to the first row and the second value correspond to the second row. So we want it to be column wise and not row wise. And that's why before we broadcast that, we first reshape it to the proper shape. So we take it the number of nucleotides, which is four by one. So we shape it into four rows and one column. And now when we broadcast that, it knows how to take this four by one matrix and broadcast it to the four by four matrix in the way that we want. Okay, now what we get is the appropriate probabilities that we wanted just using this one uh, operation. And of course, when we have a four by four matrix, it doesn't really matter in, in terms of performance. But if we had a larger matrix, it could be very substantial in terms of performance. And so you can see here some, some example of how we can use NumPy. And later in the course, we're going to see many more examples of where this shows up. OK, so, so, so this took a, a long time, but uh, we're finally finished. And with the remaining time, uh, we'll go to the lab exercise. Uh, now, the lab exercise, it contains four different questions. The first three are about the regex, which we covered at the beginning of the lesson. And the last one is about NumPy, which we covered now. Now the first three will obviously be also important for the homework exercise, which will be more about regex than NumPy. Uh, but I really want to encourage you not to skip over the fourth uh, lab question uh, 
because I think it's, it's one of your best uh, chances to really practice what we learned about NumPy. And even though it will not be very relevant for the homework exercise, it will be very, very relevant to what we're going to cover next week. We're, go we're going to speak about pandas. And I think it will be somewhat difficult for you to follow what we do next week if you don't feel comfortable with the fourth uh, question of the lab exercise. So I encourage you to take the time and, and do that as well.